Here's our catch-up of week number seven. We're going to look at lecture number one, which is plant reproduction. Here's the topics, the objectives. First thing to remember is there's a difference between mitosis and meiosis. Mitosis is asexual reproduction, where the goal is to make two complete identical copies. Meiosis is for sexual reproduction, where you make four, or roughly four, haploid gametes, which should be genetically distinct from each other. And obviously different environments dictate different reproductive methods. Sometimes asexual is preferable to sexual, and sometimes sexual is preferable to asexual. Reminder of what th uh, the stages look like. Prophase, we condense the chromosomes <coughs> and we get start to get rid of the nucleus. Prometaphase, we're going to continue to condense those chromosomes, attach the spindles. Metaphase, we're going to align those chromosomes, or at least the centromeres, along that metaphase plate. Anaphase, we're going to start to pull apart the sister chromatids, where again, recall that the chromosome is the X, but the chromatids are each individual side. Telophase, they're going to be far apart. And then we're going to trigger cytokinesis, where in plants, they actually form something called a cell plate made out of the phragmoplast. And eventually we'll have cytokinesis, which is the complete division. If you need to recall the details in meiosis one, we separate the homologous chromosomes, which is, recall that chromosomes show up in pairs. We're gonna separate those, and in meiosis two, we're gonna separate the chromatids. This is just like mitosis, whereas meiosis one is not. We also get the formation of chiasmata, which is to say crossing over events, and that results in recombination. Plants follow what's known as the alternation of generations, which is to say they actually exist in two different forms. And the most famous example of this that has nothing to do with plants are the alien franchise, where you have the xenomorph and the facehugger. They're the, it's the same creature, but in two different styles. In plants, we refer to this as the sporophyte generation and the gametophyte generation. The gametophyte is haploid, and the sporophyte turns out to be diploid. And in all plants are going to oscillate between these two stages. As we look at more complex plants that are land-based, we see a diminishment of the gametophyte generation, and you see a the dominance of the sporophyte generation, but they're still present, if you know where to look. If we look at flowers, because we're looking at angiosperms specifically, this is actually where we're going to find the gametophyte generation. It's actually hidden within. So basic anatomy, we're going to have the sepals, which are going to be the leaves of the flower. We'll have the petals, which are going to have multiple colors and they're usually there to attract pollinators. We're going to have the male component which is called the stamen composed of the anther and the filament. Within the anther is going to be pollen and pollen contains the male gametophyte. So here you're being shown a simple pistil and the pistil is composed in this case of one carpal. So the entire structure is a pistil. The individual vase or vase shapes are carpals. Each of those vase shapes consists of a stigma style and an ovary. Within the ovary will be ovules, and within the ovules will be the female gametophyte. When we look at flowers, it turns out that we have multiple ways of making these flowers, and it's controlled by what we call the ABC hypoth hypothesis which involves three genes. We use this to explain the fact that there are some incomplete flowers, meaning they do not contain all of these parts. So a perfect flower or a complete flower has all of these, whereas an incomplete flower is missing some of these parts. If you have a monaceous plant, this is when you have one plant only and they could have complete or incomplete flowers it depends on location 
dioecious plants, meaning there's a male and a female, or what we would call a male and female, are always incomplete. What we notice with this ABC hypothesis is we get these overlapping genes that are expressed, and they help explain the formation of sepals, petals, carp stamens, and carpels. So, for example, only gene A would form the the petals, or the, excuse me, the um, sepals. Only gene C gets carpels. B plus C is going to produce stamens, and then A and B are going to produce the petals. So we can start to see patterns, and if we were to eliminate some of these or duplicate or whatever, we can start to get these mutants of varying forms of flowers. There's also a lot of coevolution with flowers and pollinators, so it explains why some flowers have really weird shapes. A lot of plants, not all, but a lot, are capable of self-fertilization, but even then there's still concerns over it. So there's a series of genes that can recognize self. And limit self fertilization. So it's possible, but after a while it starts to stop. All angiosperms are going to utilize what's known as double fertilization, meaning you need two sperm to fertilize. If I look inside the ovule, you're actually going to find a whole bunch of different types of cells. Some are called the antipodal, some are called synergids, some, one of them is going to be the egg, and then we're going to have this strange thing called the polar nuclei. One of these sperm is going to fertilize the egg, and the other one is going to fertilize the polar nuclei. A fertilized egg is going to give you the embryo, which is going to be diploid, and the fertilized polar nuclei is going to produce a structure called the endosperm, which is triploid. And this is going to be the food source. So if we look through all these pictures, which I have through here, what we can see is within the anther will contain what we call the microsporocyte or the cells that are eventually going to make the sperm or the male gametophyte. So this structure here is the male gametophyte. It's made exclusively of haploid tissue. It's going to land on the stigma, and if it's allowed to pollinate, it will form a pollen tube, which is then going to grow down into where the ovules are. Within the ovary and the ovules, you're going to have a megasporangium, or the cells that are going to give rise to the female gametophyte. They also go through mitosis or meiosis then mitosis, and they will produce eventually the female gametophyte. It has a bunch of different types of cells. So if you could find the egg, which is right here, on either side are gonna be the synergids. On the opposite side, we're gonna have three cells, which are called the antipodal cells. And then in the center, we have two leftover nuclei, because <coughs> if you count them up, you count six. But by dividing in half, you can't make six because it goes two, four, eight. So the leftovers are what we call the polar nuclei. So the pollen tube is going to go all the way down into the ovule, and those two sperm are going to fertilize. One of them is going to fertilize the polar nuclei. The other one is going to fertilize the egg. And the result will be we're going to have a zygote, ultimately the embryo, and we're going to start to develop the endosperm, Portions of the ovary are going to start to produce the seed. So the embryo is going to be diploid. The seed coat, which is going to be from the parent plant, is going to be diploid. Endosperm is triploid. It germinates. We continue our cycle. Plants are capable of asexual reproduction too. So we know of fragmentation where you could have strawberries that send out runners then break apart apomixis is also possible where you have leaf like tiny leaflets that fall off and form new plants we also have things like this which is a quaking 
quaking aspen. So this one here, it turns out the roots are really old. So if you were to have its root system, and then it shoots up plants or stalks. And all these turn out to be clones of the roots. So everything you see in this picture here is the same organism. We also utilize this, um, how asexual reproduction works in biotechnology. So some gene manipulation involving plants. We also use it in agriculture, especially with grafting. And we can also make transgenic organisms rather easily. Gymnosperms are kind of like angiosperms in terms of their reproduction, except that there's no double fertilization, but they do make two different types of cones. So we're gonna have a male cone and a female cone. They're usually in different spots. So the male cone is gonna create the microsporangia, which will make pollen. The female will co contain the megasporocyte or the megasporangium, which will produce eggs. When they fertilize, they end up making a seed. So the seed has no fleshy outside that is what makes it not be an angiosperm, so it's not a fruit, technically, because fruit requires it to come from the parental area, and we don't have that. When we look at how seeds develop, there's a lot we don't understand because seeds are hidden and they're difficult to work with, but we know that there's an embryo in there. The embryo divides into two cells, one's called the terminal and one's called the basal cell, terminal cell is going to be is ultimately going to give you everything above ground the basal cell is going to give you everything below ground ultimately the terminal cell is going to start to form baby or embryonic leaves that are called cotyledons in between those cotyledons is going to be the shoot apex meaning if i were to look at it there's actually like a little speed bump that right there is the shoot apex while these are the cotyledons and then we'll also have the root apex see or the fruits turn out to be houses for those seeds and they actually come in a whole bunch of different varieties and it's not as simple as we'd like it to be so we have simple fruits like peas but we could also have, have aggregates of fruits called like raspberries and the reason for that is you have many carpels within the pistol you have many stamens as well so we can actually end up having lots of fertilization within one area or we could have a whole bunch of different fruits or flowers all in one spot like pineapples apples turn out where the entire flower becomes the fruit itself so it's referred to as an accessory fruit so we can go on and on about this in order to germinate that fruit, usually there's an imbibing of water that's necessary because we call gibberellic acid. Sometimes we need to have fire. And what we tend to see showing up first is either going to be called the hypocotyl or the coleoptile, <clears throat> which is this. So in a dicot, what we see first emerge will be the hypocotyl and what will then show up are the two cotyledons that's why it's called a dicot for two cotyledons in a monocot the first to show up will be the coleoptile which is the cotyledon obviously other plants have life cycles so this here would be for moss and what you happen to notice with moss is you predominantly see the gametophyte generation and the sporophyte turns out not to be as prevalent. So this would just be some moss in front of my house. And a zoom in on it. So these structures here is this structure here. So it's actually about, when I took the photo, it was where the sporophyte is actually being formed. I ended up trying to take photos of the CETA, the CD, and I missed it. So I didn't get that picture. 
This would be for a fern, where we see about a 50-50 split between um, the gametophyte generation and the sporophyte, although the sporophyte in this case is much bigger than the gametophyte. Next time, we're going to switch over into animals.